See what's new on the Burlington waterfront. Hey, now it's happening at the waterfront on Lake Champlain. Whatever the weather, there's so much to do on the new waterfront, the Burlington waterfront. Hi, welcome to On the Waterfront. I'm your host, Mariah Riggs, and director of the Main Street Landing Performing Arts Center. Uh, this month, I'm really excited to have the artist, Erica Miller, on my show. Welcome, Erica. Thank you, Malaya. So um, uh, let's kind of get into this. I've always, uh, I've always wanted to kind of talk to you a little bit about your background and find out more about you. Uh, we've done some work together, which we, I will get into shortly. Um, but uh, really quickly for our audiences, um, where did, uh, so what kind of work do you do? How would you describe your, you're an artist, but how would you describe yourself? Wow, that's a good question. I constantly think about that. Well, not constantly, but it's like I went from artist, multimedia artist, performance artist, and then I realized that I am also actually work with scent. And then the um, term multisensory artist mm -hmm. kind of came about. And um, that's kind of the one I stuck with. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I feel like uh, I was just listening to an interview with Lori Anderson and somebody asked her what she's doing. And she's like, well, I'm a storyteller. I'm like, that's a really good answer. <laughs> I'm going to steal that from her. <laughs> no, not stealing. But so. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's more than st just telling stories or not just telling, mm -hmm. st st telling stories. It's bringing people to experiences. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Yeah, I, I, that's how I would describe. I mean, m my experience with your art yeah. is that it's an experience. Um, and it and it takes on all the different dimensions of the senses, yes. um, which is which is really unique, um, and what it does and what it brings uh, to people's lives and how it affects them, uh, is very unique. Yeah. And so I guess um, you know how did you? Um, so it's interesting you talk about how you were you know video multimedia artists. I mean these are kind of it's very funny because you just talked about Laurie Anderson. Um, I was very fortunate to do an artist in residency with her oh my gosh, uh, when I was at Emerson. Wow. Um, she came and worked with us oh my gosh. Uh, for a month, uh, which was pretty awesome. Way back in the day, this is like 1998. Yeah. I'm really yeah. aging myself. 1998, we got to do a month with Laurie Anderson. That is amazing. Um, and, and work on things like like I want to hear more about that. And we'll talk about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. But um, I, and, and I think, you know, of all, you know, it's great. I actually just saw her exhibit um, at the Smithsonian. They did a yes. life retrospective. Yes. And I was fortunate enough to actually be there to go see it. That's incredible. That's and incredible. I would describe your art as the closest thing I've seen in Vermont to some of the work that Laurie Anderson does. Wow. And I kind of wanted to ask, you know, a little bit, you know, because I love the idea of a multi-sensory artist. And I, and I, think, I think the world needs more of you. Thanks. Um, <laughs> yes, I think so too. <laughs> um, static art can only do so much, yes. and and we live in this world where everything is the sensual experience, and so art is a reflection of our times and our life and our culture, and it just makes more sense to me that art should be doing more, and exciting different senses than something that's just visual, or auditory, or you know just an AV experience. It's something that is like encompassing of all facets of how you experience the world. And so well, I wanted to ask how you got there. So that, well, how I got there is kind of a long, long mm -hmm. story. Yeah. Starting when I was a kid, I was kind of like all kids. And like where did you grow up? Oh, OK. So you want to start? Yeah, we're going to start the there. We're starting there. there. OK, okay. Yes. so I uh, grew up in Bavaria mm -hmm. in a small town called Magd Oberdorf, which is really close to the fairy castle, Schloss Neuschwanstein. Lucky so you. I remember walking up that steep hill like when I was three years old to the castle, and I had these black patent leather shoes on and I stopped every like two steps and had to polish them because <laughs> I loved the shininess of them. I still remember I drove my pants crazy, but it was still a good experience. Anyway, so then when I was uh, six and a half, we moved to uh, the Frankfurt area, mm -hmm. which is a little more north. And there I went to elementary school. And then when I was after fifth grade, however old you are then, we moved to Sweden. So then I had middle school in Sweden, which was absolutely incredible. Mm -hmm. And then for high school, we moved back to Germany. And it wasn't because of my schooling, it was because of my dad's yep. work. Um, and I did high school in Heidelberg. Okay. And then I moved back to, I worked a little bit in England, I moved back to Sweden, I went back to Germany to get my, to study, go to college. Then I worked in uh, Italy and 
and ultimately ended up in Frankfurt, mm -hmm. um, uh, worked with PR, and uh, also studied dance. Wow, and then, I did not know that. Yes, so I have my, um, I studied with one of Mary Wigman's mm -hmm. master students. Oh, wow. So Mary Wigman is yeah. kind of the expressionist dancer, dance, th uh, dance theater, original mm -hmm. dance theater person. And um, so I had this two year long, beautiful degree and experience in studying with one of her master students. Mm -hmm. And um, then after that, I toured. So I completely lived out of my bag for two <laughs> years, which is kind of just <laughs> Which is perfect. a time in your life to actually do that. I, it was so perfect. <laughs> we did like big, uh, big uh, street theater, outdoors, like site specific like theater mm -hmm. and uh, two, uh, um, two musicians and four dancers of us and one director. And we built our own kind of set wow. and uh, s s sculptures. And it was just awesome. And, and just for the viewers out there who aren't really aware of this, Europe has this absolutely yes, fabulous that. performing art scene yes. where they they really, um, you know, I know we do we do Festival Fools here in Burlington, which is sort of a small scale version. But in Europe, there's this infrastructure that allows artists to really tour and do performance art in the streets of Europe, yes. which is a wonderful incubation space. Yes. But actually, it's funny because my last performance I had with them was in Atlanta. <laughs> was a, there was the oh, World wow. Fest in Atlanta, so wow. I ended up like that. Can that's, we do uh, uh, yeah, which is really funny. But then I felt like two years of that was awesome, mm -hmm. and I was just had more appetite for going back to school. Yep. And um, I applied to um, NYU, to Temple University, to a school in Holland and in, in London for dance. Mm -hmm. And I knew that you can't really study performance, mm -hmm. but I wanted to study the education part of it. So okay. um, I ultimately ended up at Temple University in Philadelphia, okay. where I um, was accepted to get my master's in dance education, okay. and I had an amazing time there. And after the first year, so I had one semester left. So there were two, two sem after two semesters, you have the end of the year review, mm -hmm. and they asked me if I wanted to, if I ever thought about getting a doctorate, and I'm like. Sure, if you <laughs> pay for it. I was like, you are actually thinking giving you a teaching fellowship. Yep. So I mean, okay, great. So it was awesome. It was yeah, and that's good. another thing. If you're not aware of it, it's a great track. Um, once you get to a certain point at certain schools, if you have a master's and you're asked to do a doctorate, uh, usually there's a teaching fellowship that actually helps support you um, by getting a doctorate, yeah. which is, is, is part of the academic track. Uh, to those of you who are not aware of that, it's kind of an amazing... Um, educational lift and sort of a tuition hack in America. Uh, which tuition is, which hack is like, and it just strengthened yes. my experience so yeah. much more because I was able to study, I was able to teach, I was yeah. able to perform, kind yeah. of did all of it. Yeah, which is so, great. Yeah. And then I, um, well, I also got my master's in physical therapy and my training in Alexander Technique, but that's kind of another tangent that <laughs> brings me back to my body. It was, yeah. it was a good time. In there was a lot of body work. There's a lot of body work. <laughs> um, and at the end of, well, I kind of was at the end of my studies, mm -hmm. I met my husband. Okay. And he was, um, he was going back to school. He had just mm -hmm. applied to uh, uh, medical school. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, because he'd been out trying to not to be a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, ultimately yeah. just knew he would go back. Yeah. And we ended up in, uh, at, he ended up at UVM. And oh, here you, here so that's are. how you got to Vermont. That's how I got to Vermont. Thank yes. you. That's always been my missing puzzle yes. piece. I'm yes. so excited yes. to find out today. And you know, the funny thing is that I've moved about, I think I counted it once like 17 times in my life. Mm -hmm. And then we moved to Vermont. And I have been here since 1995. That's significant. So, which is so crazy for me. So there was this moment, like, <laughs> I'd only lived here for like six years, mm -hmm. and somebody was asking me kind of a, for directions. Mm -hmm. And I automatically just said, it's like, oh, I don't really know I'm new here. And the person asked, how long have you lived here? And I was like, um, six years. <laughs> <laughs> that was the moment where I needed to, where I knew <laughs> I needed to rewrite my script and yeah. really rewire my thinking mm -hmm. because I wasn't new there anymore by no means. So no. it's like, it, I, I, had the lo I had the hardest time to, f to mm -hmm. learn how to be in one place. Yeah. I like, I still go through this exercise every couple of years where I was like, okay, what, like, <laughs> what's the minimum? Like, how long will it take me to pack up these boxes and move yes. somewhere? If I just want to. Exactly. I, it's more about being knowing you can. Exactly. That freedom, right? Yes. So, um, yeah. So, but here I am, like <laughs> 20. Well, like we'll keep you. 30 years. You're, not allowed, to, you're <laughs> not allowed to leave anytime soon. 
We like having you here. I love it. I love it. <laughs> this, is, this is my home in a way, you know, it's like, yeah. Well, I'm sure so. a lot of you can appreciate that as well. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, thank you. I've always wondered that. And so, you know, it, it's very interesting thinking about it now because I didn't realize your background is in dance. And so, you know, dance is a experience that utilizes every part of the body. Yes. So it makes sense that that would lead into how you express art. But my, ex my, my original experience is actually in visual art. Okay. And then I started, started studying dance in my 20s because okay. I'm not a good ballet dancer. I did, not, I did one ballet class when I was six years old and I thought it was incredibly boring. I never set a foot in, my, in a ballet studio again wow. until I was in my 20s and recovering from a head injury, ski injury, I found movement as mm -hmm. a rehabilitative tool. Mm -hmm. So movement supported by breath yeah. and that's then through serendipity I kind of fell into uh, this dance training that was kind of just felt like coming home in a way yeah. because it was working with I was able to use my own expression mm -hmm. I mean we had technique training we had ballet and modern dance classes mm -hmm. to kind of to school to train our body which is kind of the mm -hmm. tool of expression for a dancer mm -hmm. But ultimately, the choreography is, comes from you. Yep. And that's, I was really interested in that. So it's mm -hmm. really kind of the pre-stage two performance art in a way. Well, of course, because you're using the human body as your, can you know, your canvas. That's exactly. sort of the mechanism yes. that creates um, you know, effect to the audience. Yes, exactly. And um, you know, as a choreographer, those are sort of your brush strokes. Yes. Exactly, um, exactly. Which then leads you to thinking of other ways to incorporate movement and visualization. And again, as choreography, as anybody in dance knows, the music is also of vital importance. Yes. Um, or you could just have silence. But it's nice that, you know, how, the, how, how the, all those things work together yeah. leads to sort of a multi sensual experience. That and then over the years, as, mm -hmm. as the digital world became bigger and mm -hmm. more in our lives, I noticed that people in any conversation, in any kind of thing, it's so easy to forget our body. We talk about all the things that are out there, but everybody forgets that without this, there's nothing out mm -hmm. there. So, right? Yeah, no, so it's So it's like my work, I'm technically, I don't have the patience for it and I don't have the brain for it, mm -hmm. but I, so for me, it's really important to give people an exper a visceral experience. Mm -hmm. Not audience participation, because I think that's terrible. Like yeah. when you're in the circus and you get called up <laughs> on stage, and it's like, oh my gosh, that's awful. But uh, uh -huh. like a personal mm -hmm. experience that brings them back to their body and that reminds each of us that we are human. Mm -hmm. so. And also that relationship of how you relate to your body. Exactly, exactly. Um, and maybe changing that relationship too is, is, is a nice way to um, have art so it changes your perspective and how you relate to your body is, is a nice way to kind of bring, break people out of their comfort zone. Yes, yes. Just at the edge of the comfort zone. <laughs> we don't wanna, I don't want to throw them over the cliff because nobody wants that, right? So full, dis <laughs> full disclosure, when I first met Erica, she uh, told me she wanted to find the most industrial part of my entire building. <laughs> and I think to quote, she wanted to find the bowels of the building. Um, and I don't think I've ever met with anybody within the first five minutes who've asked to go to the bowels of my building. Um, <laughs> which I instantly knew Erica was a kindred spirit uh, because I, I totally get that. And, and that is sort of, um, that's something I really like about the work that I've seen of yours is that it, um, it incorporates space you know, and I'm assuming that comes from a performance, you know, art perspective, is that the space that you inhabit for the art is part of the experience. Space is really important. And I, it actually, I was inspired by, no, actually it started before I went to Antarctica, but I am interested in, um, in spaces as with people, communities, spaces that are kind of overlooked because I think, you know, fancy theaters and movie theaters and flashy kind of online stuff, that's kind of easy to see, that's kind of loud mm -hmm. in a way, or, you know, but it also is a divider. I know, having worked with the Flynn Theater for many years, I know for some mm -hmm. it's a barrier to go to the theater. Mm -hmm. They don't know how, what to wear and what to say and how to behave and so on. Mm -hmm. And I am interested in 
not having that barrier and bringing the art to the people. Mm -hmm. So when I ask you about the bowels of the building, <laughs> where are the, because every, yep. every part of a building is used, you know, whether it's taking out the trash mm -hmm. um, or parking the cars. Right? <laughs> so those are the yeah. parts that we normally, in our everyday life, we kind of try to just ignore. Mm -hmm. And for me, there is some, like, the, the beauty and the magic in these ignored kind of utilitarian places. Mm -hmm. I think, like, it's so rich, right? So I also think, um, you know, just from my experience, and this is just my perspective, is that also sometimes being in a space that you don't, that you do tend to kind of have blinders, you experience every day, but you don't actually experience or look in yes. or spend time in, yes. to put people in a space like that, uh, leads people to be more ref reflexive. And they're also much more open to being receptive because sometimes being, and this is me as a theater owner, but um, you know, people are much more resp responsive to places that are, set them into a different space that they're not fully comfortable with or that they don't have pre-expectations in. Yes, yes. That and at the same time, a space that everybody knows. Mm -hmm. Nobody, let's take you know the work we did together so beautifully. Um, Nobody is kind of has anxiety to go into a parking garage, especially if it's lit up. You know, I mean, there's there yeah, are other yeah. anxieties, but mm -hmm. not. Um, so it's not a very. I feel like these spaces they equalize us. Mm -hmm. They put us all. It's kind of an estuary, right? It doesn't matter what your annual income is and what your parents did mm -hmm. and what your degree is. In the parking garage, we are all equal, right? Yeah. yeah. Because we all go there to park our car and mm -hmm. or. You know, to use the back exit for, if the front mm -hmm. is not open and so on. So in that kind of equal, um, that equal place, that mm -hmm. equal site, that is interesting to me. Yeah, it's a democratic space. It's exactly. a space of equality. Exactly, yes. Um, and, yes. And, and there's something lovely about that. And there's also not better seats, too. I mean, it's, that's the other that's thing, the other too, thing, right? Yes. You know, yes. there's always that hierarchy, like how, how nice are your seats, how close are they to the stage. That's a really good point. I haven't thought about that. That yeah. always ties into the socioeconomic, yes. you know. I mean, that goes back to in Europe, you know, where, you know, the, the boxes where the aristocrats hung out, and then there was, the, you know, the crowds in the bottom, and it was a whole, it was a whole socioeconomic yes. thing Yes. as well. And by not having these comfy seats, you also can't check out of your body because it's so easy that we just kind of lounge and just let things kind of wash mm -hmm. over us. If you have to stand, mm -hmm. and I always make sure that, the, that the, uh, my performances are not mm -hmm. two hours long, I always want to make sure that you know, the experience is such that it's maybe just a little bit at the edge of the comfort zone, mm -hmm. but not like that people start looking at their watch and be like, I need to sit down now or go. Yeah. And also always have seats for people who are not able to stand up. Mm -hmm. And I always make sure that it's kind of also ADA accessible. accessible. And, and so I think also this is a good segue. Uh, you already went there. But um, I met Erica actually because she came in and um, did an, ex an amazing experience uh, during the last Vermont International Film Festival um, where she brought people down our stairwell. Um, and there, uh, Chris Jeffries, another artist, uh, did a whole experience in our stairwell that was with light and smell and sound. And people went from being up in the performing arts to all the way down to the, to the, to the bowels of the building yeah. and our underground parking garage, uh, where, uh, where, where then they had this really full experience with dancers and um, sort of a very industrial themed uh, uh, production. Um, and so it was this whole like movement through space and then back through. And um, I'd love you to explain that a little bit to our audience because it really was a wonderful work. Thank you. Thank you. So we were invited to the um, VTIF, to the International Film Festival, with our nine minute long film, and um, which was great. But I feel like uh, nine minutes, you, by the time somebody sits down, like the nine minutes are over, right? So, and I also always think about, okay, what else can we do? Like there are so many layers, and not just the film, which is, was a beautiful work in itself, collaboration with Lucas Hoffman. And um, when you, so this was actually working with you was the first time I worked with a site that didn't have the 
obvious grittiness. Mm -hmm. You know, I've done an opera in the parking garage, I've worked in the salt shed, I've worked in the Moran plant when it was still standing. So there was a story of the building mm -hmm. and I just initially I just couldn't get traction because it's a beautiful building mm -hmm. and it does theater, <laughs> right? So I was like, okay, so where are the cracks? Where's the grittiness mm -hmm. of it? And then you actually, was your idea, mm -hmm. he was like, what about the parking garage? And that's when kind of everything just came together because mm -hmm. it was perfect. And it had a giant fan that was very aesthetically Which was pleasing. Which so beautiful. And by the way, the acoustics in the mm -hmm. parking garage, was, they are unbelievable. Thank you. That's, that's actually very interesting. To, I didn't know that about a parking garage. Yes. I think you should have more concerts <laughs> down there. So. We'll have to talk. <laughs> yes. It's, it can be a whole series. Exactly. It's, it's actually underground. So underground. Yeah. There, you go. there you go. There you go. So the parking garage felt like there was the, was the right place for... Um, for the film, mm -hmm. which is a very gritty kind of, it was filmed on a junkyard, partially. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it kind of fit that. And then there was the question of kind of how, what's the experience? For me, the experience for the viewer starts with when they enter, like when they get their ticket. Mm -hmm. So then I made this uh, program that kind of literally unfolded. So people were standing in the foyer waiting for the door, for the little side door into the parking, like into the stairways to open. Mm -hmm. And so they were unfolding this ticket and they had to turn it, like this program, and they had to turn it and fold it up again and so on. So there's already the engagement in the body. Mm -hmm. They already had like, had something actually to do, mm -hmm. to move with. And then the uh, staircase, mm -hmm. I felt like, um, I was thinking of like Jungian, like the 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 mm -hmm. metaphor of the you know going down in the depth of your under of mm -hmm. your subconscious. Right? Yep. So I want, but I wanted it to be magical. So this kind of fairy staircase. So I found and it was kind of re uh, recommended to Chris Jeffrey, who does this beautiful. Uh, how would you describe it? Like kaleidoscope uh, lighting. Light, light. I actually, um, full disclosure, I just hired uh, Chris to do an installation. That's so exciting. Summer, which wow. is really exciting. So thank you for that. Oh, thank you for introducing that's us. That's awesome. I can't wait <laughs> to see it. He does beautiful work. Yes, he does. Absolutely. So he created this absolute magic in the in the staircase, and so people are walking down there. And and part of my thinking is always also, what if like each piece in itself needs to be a full experience? Mm -hmm. Because the pessimist in me or the, fear, the fearful person in me mm -hmm. is like, what if the power goes out? Or what if the film doesn't work? Or what if the music? So, or what if the performers that I had don't show up? You know? mm -hmm. So it's always like for me, it's like, okay, what if only one of these elements mm -hmm. would be the only element people experience? Wow. And I want that to be a full, meaningful experience in itself. Because then you add one meaningful experience to another, to another, to another, and you create magic, essentially. And yep. you can only do that when you work with... Because it's people. comprehensive, and they all are standalone. So then it becomes an incredibly, like, omnipresent experience. Yes. Yes, exactly. Omnipresent experience. I love that. Yeah. I'm going to quote you on that one. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> but but it, it, it is, and I, I, I really salute the work that you did uh, during you. the festival. It was quite remarkable. We had great feedback from it. Um, and hopefully we get to do something with you again sometime Love soon. Love that, yes, um, definitely. So I wanted to quickly uh, come back. We have, we have all these questions we haven't even gotten to. Uh -huh. um, so um, so uh, now that we've talked about this a little bit, uh, art, you know, we've talked about how it's multi-sensual. Uh, it, it, it comes from so many different places. You like it to be able to free, be freestanding, but also be together as a creative whole. Um, where, you know, where do you, where do you think uh, where does your art come from when you're working on a piece? That's a good question. It feels like it's just, it sounds really trite, but it's just kind of just, I, li mm -hmm. I literally, for example, the opera I did in the parking garage, mm -hmm. I literally, I always wanted to do something with, um, well, actually, let's start with, uh, with the film mm -hmm. that we're yep. talking about. That was actually uh, connecting with Lukas Hoffmann, who is a filmmaker, and um, he was interested in my work, I was interested in his work, and I showed him some of the costumes I'd done for other pieces. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I guess, and we started talking, mm -hmm. and like within two meetings, we, like, we realized that we were making a film together. Oh. I'd never made a film, and then <laughs> he felt like it was just after COVID, uh -huh. so he's like, wow, we should make a sci-fi film. It's like, I don't really, I have no idea about sci-fi. But then I realized, well, science, science, I'm interested in science, mm -hmm. and 
I know fiction, I know yep. storytelling. So I guess I do know sci-fi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so we just started working together and mm -hmm. I made these, made, made these characters and we found sites. And so it just kind of, it just literally just came together. So you feel like it's more reactionary cause and effect, that it's an organic process that builds on itself. Well, that one was another piece I did, auto, autobiography was an opera I did in the parking garage in Burlington. I seem to like parking yeah. garages. <laughs> um, and that was, um, I've always, I've always been fascinated with the smell in cars, mm -hmm. and cars are part of my life because my dad made his life mm -hmm. and his living with cars. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I just feel like they literally transport you through different stages of life. Oh, wow. So I've all kind of that's been in the back of my mind. I was like, what is it? What is it? But I didn't feel like I had a hook, right? I, just, mm -hmm. I don't do stuff just because I can. And then one morning, it's funny. It kind of fits into your. It kind of fits into your aesthetic because the car is sort of the unsung hero of the modern age. Yes, you know, totally. Uh, You're so right. Yes. And 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 so it, you know, again, it's one of those things we see every day. We don't notice. Yes. Right. Yes. But it's so crucial, it's, and it's changed so much about how human beings experience life. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. It, mm -hmm. I, I I guess I tend to go to industrial yeah. themes in a way. Which, which um, I love. So. But, yeah. But at the same time, I <laughs> love being out in nature, but mm -hmm. it's just, yeah. I don't think anybody can top nature, so I'm just like, well, there's nothing to add to this. I'm going to make something about the stuff you can add something and, to it. And, and sometimes, too, living in nature, as we do in Vermont, yes. I mean, it's, it surrounds us, and it's so a, a crucial part of our experience yes. that sometimes uh, making art that's almost the opposite or yes. the contrast to yes. that experience, uh, we find more... Um, more inspiring. You know, you're so right. Thank you for saying that. Because I always say, if I would live in New York City, I think I would be sitting in my studio and making water, like flower, watercolor flowers or something like that. It's very true. Because, you know. It, in some ways, it's an escapist mentality. Yeah. You're escaping your day to day because mm -hmm. it's something that's very different than what your day in day is a reflection of. Or you create the balance. Yeah. Because it's so easy in Vermont to say, <laughs> oh, it's so beautiful here, and look at the trees and so on. But we yep. do have problems with pollution, with cars, with all that. We also, even if we are here, even more actually, we're, we're using our cars more mm -hmm. in Vermont than yep. we do in New York City, for example. Very much so. So, yes. As yes. any Vermonter knows who lives outside of Burlington, I don't know how many of you there are, but uh, we drive, you can't lease a car because you drive too much. Yeah. Ex yeah, exactly. It's, exactly. It's, a, it's a real thing. Yeah. So with, with autobiography, mm -hmm. I literally one morning woke up and felt like it's the ring cycle. And I was like, okay, and then I started researching, you know. The ring cycle, Wagner's, Wagner's the, ring yeah, cycle, yes. which is, of course, then fraught in many ways, but there's something yes. very archetypal about it. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, I, and it's just kept growing from there. Okay. And there was a time when, like, winter was always the time where little seeds got planted. Mm -hmm. And then by the fall, I, um, yeah, the performance would be ready. So yes. that's kind of how that started. And that's like your natural process. That seems to be the natural process, yes. Yes. Well, because winter is that time of inner, inner reflection. Yes, exactly. Right? And that's then the creative right. happens when, when all everything blooms and it's beautiful out. And yeah, that's production yeah, time. It's then. production it's time. It's like farmers, you know, in the fall, <laughs> you just got to go out and get the harvest in. And, and all harvest that, it so. all, and in the winter, it, think about what you're going to do next year. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yes, yes. That's very seasonal of you. It's, yeah. it's so Vermont. I didn't, I didn't plan it, but it seems to work in a way. So I want to quickly uh, give a shout out to, um, for all of you uh, looking, please, uh, please uh, check out Erica um, on Instagram. A lot of the work we've been talking about um, is on our Instagram page, um, <clears throat> which is Instagram. It's at Erica Spent M. Uh, it's up on the. You can find it. On you my can find it. Too. It's right there at the <laughs> bottom. See, there it is. Thank you. Please go check her out on Instagram. And there's also uh, great videos of Erica's work as well on Vimeo. So uh, that should also be at the bottom of the screen if you'd like to check out all of her work. It's remarkable. Uh, there's nobody else in the state of Vermont doing the work that you do, Erica. Thank you so much. And I uh, greatly respect uh, your perspective and view on the world. And I'm so glad you bumbled into my space. I'm so and I got glad. To meet you. <laughs> we were, I knew we were kindred spirits when you're like, park, let's show, let me show you our parking garage. I'm like, I like that woman. Yeah. <laughs> so awesome. uh, thank you so much uh, for being on the show. It's been a delight. Um, please check out all of her work. Um, it's really remarkable. Um, it will affect your life and how you experience it. 
Um, and so uh, highly recommended. Um, thank you guys all so much for being here this month uh, for Mariah Riggs and Erica. I will see you right back here next month. Take care. Thank you so much.